In this video, we're going to talk about rebar. What is it? What is it good for? And why did I decide to go ahead and put some in my slab? As you can see, I've got this grid of rebar already into my form and ready for me to pour the concrete. Deciding exactly how much rebar you need is a fairly complicated process. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before I get too far down the road of showing you what I did with my concrete and the rebar, I wanted to talk about why I did what I did with my rebar and the concrete. So let's start with what is rebar. Rebar is uh, short for reinforcing bar, and it's, it's bars of metal, uh, like this one, that you put into the concrete to give it extra strength. So concrete is really good under compression. That's when you're squeezing things together. The concrete mix that I'm gonna be using is uh, rated to 6,000 pounds per square inch, which seems like an awful lot. It should be very, very strong concrete. But concrete is not strong at all under tension. That's when you try and pull things. So I'm gonna be adding some rebar, uh, this reinforced bar, to my concrete in a grid pattern to help reinforce the strength under tension. Now, this bar is very, very strong under tension. You can, uh, you can kind of imagine it like a steel rope. When you're playing tug of war, you can get a lot of tension pulling on this and it's not gonna stretch or deflect or bend or break. So you may be asking yourself, when does concrete ever stretch? Well, the answer to that is this concrete slab is about four inches thick. And so if you imagine the slab like this, if it were to have the ground underneath it begin to flex and move a little bit like this, the top part of the concrete would be stretched, would be put under tension, while the bottom part of the concrete would be put under compression. That's if the ground was pushing up. If you put a heavy load on top of it, then it would have a tendency to bend down like this, and the top part would go under compression, and the bottom part would go under tension or pull. So if the ground shifts underneath the concrete, it will have a tendency to crack, essentially is what's gonna happen. So I'm adding the rebar in an effort to hopefully avoid letting my concrete slab crack. So rebar is essentially just a big piece of metal like this. It comes in different diameters. The most common are 3 8 of an inch and 1 half of an inch. This is a half inch piece. Uh, this is bigger than what I'm gonna use in the slab. I'm actually only using 3 8 inch in the slab. And there's also, instead of full-on rebar, uh, some people recommend if you're doing a smaller slab like this, you can just use a metal grid, like you could uh, use a small piece of metal fencing or uh, specific uh, concrete grids that they sell at the home center. Here's a few examples. You can see this one here has uh, fairly large squares uh, compared to this other one, which has fairly small squares and is of a smaller gauge uh, of metal or thinner metal. Uh, I've also heard of people using just this rolled up fencing uh, in their concrete. So the problem with all of these though is that the metal is very smooth. There's nothing for the concrete to grip. Whereas on rebar that is specifically designed for this, it has these ridges right in here that the concrete will wrap around, get into, and will hold on to very, very tightly. And so that's why I chose regular rebar. Uh, I chose 3 8 because that was the size I thought was appropriate for my slab. I chose to space it at 16 inches and a grid across my slab, um, mostly because that's what felt right to me. Now I've done a lot of research about this on the internet, and there doesn't seem to be a clear consensus about how close together or how far apart you need to put your rebar, particularly in a slab this size. In fact, most people said in a slab this size, don't even bother. If your ground is stable, it's not going to crack. I live in an area that has a fairly wide temperature range and concrete does get affected by temperature. It will expand and contract uh, as it gets hot and cold. And so in order to make it as stable as possible, I went ahead and put in a grid of rebar. Now I know me waving my hands around like this kind of gives you the idea, but if you're looking for a better illustration of exactly what I mean by compression versus tension, there's an excellent video that I watched that helped me really wrap my head around exactly where in the concrete I should put the rebar and why I should put it there. And I'll put a link down in the description that you can go check out yourself. Okay, so now that we know just a little bit more about rebar, I'm going to get into exactly what I did and how I did it. Okay, so getting back to exactly how much rebar do you need. I'm a very visual person, and so I decided to go ahead and model my forms and the slab itself in three dimensions. This would allow me to lay out in a grid and to decide exactly how many pieces of rebar and in what configuration I would need. As you can see, you want to make sure that the rebar is not going to touch the edges of the form because you don't want water to get in and rust the rebar inside your slab after you've poured. 
and laying things out this way made it very easy for me to visualize exactly how much I was going to need. So my slab is 8 feet by 16 feet. But of course they don't sell rebar in 8 foot and 16 foot lengths. At my local home center they sell it in 10 foot and 20 foot lengths. So I decided for the long ways to just use 10 foot lengths and overlap them in the middle so I wouldn't have a lot of waste. Similarly, for the rebar going the other way, I took a 10 foot piece and cut it in half and then overlap those two 5 foot pieces. The result is this nice symmetrical grid. And as I mentioned before, I decided to space these at 16 inches on center. So when I got to my local home center, I did some quick math and realized that it was far more economical to buy 20 foot lengths and cut them in half to be 10 feet rather than buying the 10 foot lengths they had already there. In fact, doing it this way saved me over $50. But it did mean that I got to stand in the parking lot with a hacksaw and cut a bunch of rebar. I found that I really only had to cut about halfway through and then I could just snap the rebar in half over my knee. It really helped to have a fresh blade on my hacksaw. And I think for the money it saved me, the 10 minutes this took to do was well worth it. After I was finished cutting them, I gave them a quick coat of some spray paint just to avoid rust. Took them home and then it was time to get started. Here's a printout of my grid that I used for reference while we were laying out the rebar. I explained to my wife the way that it needed to be done and got her started laying out the long sections while I went and cut the five foot sections that needed to be done. Just like when you're cutting lumber, it makes sense to set up a stop block so that all of your pieces wind up being cut to the same length. At first I started cutting these with the hacksaw again, again cutting about halfway through and then snapping off the piece. But then I realized, I'm not standing in the parking lot anymore. I have access to power tools here. So I grabbed my jigsaw and tried that, but the metal blade on it was so dull it wasn't getting through this rebar at all. So then I tried a rotary tool, and the cutoff discs that I have worked pretty well, and the kids really liked the sparks, but they kept shattering, and it was too time consuming to keep having to switch out the cutoff discs. So I just finished them all up with the hacksaw. Once we had the pieces cut to the correct length, we just laid out the rest of the grid following the plan that I'd printed out. And once the grid was in place, then we used these wire ties to tie them all together at their intersections. It's important to note these ties don't actually add any strength at all to your concrete or to the rebar. All they do is help make sure the rebar doesn't move during the pour. For a small slab like this, it's easy enough to just twist them by hand. But if you're going to be doing a larger slab, you can either rent or purchase a tool that makes these much easier to twist together. Once the grid was all locked together, we placed some risers underneath it. You can see these risers are just plastic. I like these plastic risers because they're going to be right at the very bottom of the concrete, right where it meets the gravel, and water can get up in there. If I used metal risers, there's a potential that that metal could rust. So using these plastic ones will prevent that problem. I evenly distributed the risers through the whole grid. After finishing with the risers, my son and I dragged this board across the top to make sure that there were no wires sticking up and that all of the rebar was well inside the confines of where the concrete was going to be. So now the forms are almost ready for concrete. There's one more thing I want to take care of before the concrete arrives, and that has to do with the wall anchors. I'm going to cover all of that in my next video, so if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, go ahead now so you don't miss it. And thanks for watching.